Hello and welcome to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. My name is John Dinsey, and it's a blessing for me to be with you during this hour. And I am blessed to have the 3ABN family with us, part of them at least. And we want to present each and every one of them to you that are going to be participating in this week's lesson entitled Light from the Sanctuary, lesson number eight from this quarterly that deals with the great controversy. So to my left, Sister Jill Morricone. Thank you, Pastor Johnny. On Monday, we look at In the Holy of Holies. Amen. We have uh, Jason Bradley with us. Welcome. Thank you, Pastor Denzi. On Tuesday, we have The Judgment Has Come. Excellent. So we now move to Wednesday, Pastor John Lomacang. And mine is The Good News of the Most Holy Place. Excellent. Some Praise the Lord. Thank you. We also have Professor Daniel Perrin. Yes, and I have some good news as well. Thursday's title is Jesus, Our Advocate in the Judgment. Amen. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to each and every one of those. And uh, part of this is uh, we have to prepare notes. We have to study and pray and ask for God to lead us. So we have prepared notes and these notes are available to you to help you in your study. So we want to encourage you to write by sending an email to us as SSP at 3abn.org, ssp at 3abn.org. Those are the letters from Sabbath School Panel, ssp at 3abn.org. And you will be put on a list and you will be getting them every week. And many have done so and are telling us that they are blessed by the notes. Uh, now, mind you, these are notes that are, we know what they're saying, we know where to go with them. So they may not be exactly what you're looking for, but we know that some prepare very nice and neat and uh, very uh, detailed, but some just have Bible verses. Mm -hmm. So we bring these to you with the hope and prayer that it will be a blessing to you. Before we begin, we're going to the Lord in prayer and I ask uh, Brother Jason Bradley, if you will lead us, please. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you for the opportunity we have to study your word together. And uh, Father, we just ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit to guide us through this study. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. amen. Thank you so much. So I began with uh, the Sabbath School afternoon uh, part of the lesson. I want to read to you the memory text is taken from Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 and 2. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. During the time of 1844, there was great expectation among many Christian believers, hundreds, thousands. As a matter of fact, it numbers into hundreds of thousands, and some say up to a million people believed that Jesus Christ was coming in 1844. One of the main people mentioned in history is William Miller. We heard some, something about that during the last week's lesson. And William Miller was the main person that the Lord led to study the prophetic timelines of Daniel. And he came to the conclusion that the Lord was coming in 1844. As he began to share this, more and more interest developed. And actually, here in the U.S., their estimates are that over... 300 people, ministers, and about a thousand or more lay people were preaching this all over the United States. But it was not only in the United States, there was a movement practically worldwide. Dr. Joseph Wolf, also called a missionary of the world because he traveled extensively in Africa, Egypt, uh, Abyssinia, Asia, also Palestine, Syria, Persia, Bakra, and India. He also visited the United States and was allowed to use the Hall of Congress to even do a seminar there. In South America, La Cunza, a Spaniard priest, was also preaching under the name Rabbi Ben Israel. And he also wrote a book called The Coming of Jesus in Spanish, but it was also translated to English and was brought over to England and was spreading all over. In Europe, this was also great of great interest. There was a Lutheran minister named Bengo in Germany, and he also taught that Jesus Christ was coming soon. There was great interest in this and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people prepared for the return of Jesus Christ and the date, October 22nd, 1844. Many people were waiting, uh, calculating the times mentioned in Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, looking at Daniel chapter 9, and they were in great expectation. 
Unfortunately, this did not happen. There was a miscalculation in the event and not in the time. Something happened on October 22nd, 1844, and you're gonna hear more about that during this study. It was a great disappointment, but many people kept studying the Bible. And these people were called Millerites. Some were also, there, uh, there were also some people calling them Adventists. Now, we are Seventh-day Adventists, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church did not exist in 1844. <laughs> Actually, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was uh, officially organized in 1863. So there were no Seventh-day Adventists as part of that group. But some of the members, some of the people that believed that Jesus Christ was coming in 1844, continued studying the Bible, and the Lord led them to great light that comes from the sanctuary in heaven. And this is something important and something exciting for every one of us to understand. Now, the lesson brings out that the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven was the fulfillment of the earthly cleansing of the sanctuary as taught in the book of Leviticus. And to understand this important truth better, you compare Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8. For example, you see Babylon mentioned in Daniel chapter 7, but not really mentioned in Daniel chapter 8. Now, Media Persia is mentioned in, in chapter 7, Media Persia is mentioned in chapter 8. We also look at Greece in chapter 7, Greece in chapter 8. We also mentioned Rome as one of the powers that rose up, also mentioned in Daniel chapter 8. But more importantly is the judgment presented in Daniel chapter 7, but is mentioned as the cleansing of the sanctuary in Daniel chapter 8. So these parallels help show, as the lesson brings out, the nature of the cleansing of the sanctuary, which is the great pre-advent uh, investigative judgment. In this week's lesson, we will explore the vital biblical truths of Christ's ministry in the heavenly sanctuary. Everyone needs to understand this important teaching of God's Word because we are living in the time of the end. And we all need to know what Jesus Christ is doing for us in the heavenly sanctuary, in the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. Let's go first to Exodus chapter 25. Exodus 25, we're reading verse 8 and 9. This is talking first about the earthly sanctuary, and it says in Exodus 25, 8, And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you. That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishing, just so you shall make it. And Moses brought this instruction to the people. Exodus 25, 40 says, And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was showing, shown you on the mountain. And Moses brought this to the people of Israel, and they specifically made it according to the instruction the Lord gave them. But this was just a shadow, a symbol of the heavenly sanctuary. This is why now we go to Hebrews chapter 8 beginning in verse 1. Now notice the way this is expressed in God's Word. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Now notice, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord erected and not man. We're talking about a heavenly sanctuary. Now notice how it continues in verse 3. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. Notice how it quotes in uh, here. It says, For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain, a reference to Exodus chapter 8. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, that is, Jesus Christ has a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. This was all pointing to Jesus. The earthly tabernacle 
and the services in the tabernacle were all pointing to Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And after his sacrifice, he became our high priest. And when Jesus Christ becomes the high priest, you no longer need any earthly high priest mm -hmm. because he brings an end to the earthly uh, tabernacle and its services when he died on the cross. Mm -hmm. And I'm reading to you from the lesson. It says, as the early Adventist believers poured over the scriptures in the months following 1844, they understood that there are two sanctuaries mentioned in the Bible, the one Moses built and the great original in heaven. In the Bible, the term sanctuary are used in the Bible refers to, as used in the Bible, uh, refers to first to the tabernacle built by Moses as a pattern or type of heavenly things. And secondly, the true tabernacle in heaven to which the earthly sanctuary pointed. At the death of Christ, the typical service lost its importance. The true tabernacle in heaven is the sanctuary of the new covenant. And as the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 is fulfilled in this era, the sanctuary to which it refers must be the sanctuary of the new covenant. Mm -hmm. We heard some of this in last week's lesson and we're going to ex expand a little more during this study. So uh, it's important for you to take notes if, if necessary, take a uh, recorded, go on, listen to it over and over again on 3 ABN Sabbath School, uh, 3 ABN Plus actually, 3 ABN Plus. You can listen to it over and over again to understand it thoroughly. I read now again from the lesson, it says, at the termination of the 2,300 days, equal two years, which ended in 1844, there had been no sanctuary on earth for many centuries. Why was this? It was because in the year 70, Jerusalem was destroyed and so was the temple. So, continuing reading, thus the prophecy unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed unquestionably points to the sanctuary in heaven. This is, this is a quote from the great controversy written by Ellen G. White uh, and page 417. So uh, please understand that you can get a free copy. Is that true? That's right. That's right. You can get a free copy by calling or writing to 3ABN. You can get a free copy of the book, The Great Controversy, a what you call a must read because it talks about uh, the origin of sin. It talks about the sanctuary in heaven and how Jesus Christ is our high priest. But it also brings you to the time of the end, how this controversy between good and evil will end. So we encourage you to get a free copy by getting in contact with 3 ABN. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny. What an incredible lesson and foundation as we look at Christ ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. You're so right that 1844, what happened there was the right time. It was just the wrong event. And once they understood Christ's heavenly high priestly ministry, what a difference that made. I'm Jill Morricone. On Monday, we look at In the Holy of Holies. And we have a lot to cover, so we're going to jump right in. I've divided the lesson into two sections. The first part, we're going to look at the Day of Atonement in ancient Israel. It's important to understand what happened anciently so you understand what is happening currently in the heavenly sanctuary. So we're going to look at ancient Israel and then currently what's happening with the Day of Atonement, this pre-Advent investigative judgment in the heavenly sanctuary, the cleansing of the sanctuary. If we get to it, we'll have five takeaways from that, but we'll see if we get to it. Now, if we look at ancient Israel, the Day of Atonement, there were daily sacrifices. This was separate from the Day of Atonement. People would uh, bring their sins, bring the perfect lamb or the perfect offering, confess them over the head and the animal was killed. The priests took care of these types of offerings. There were many different types of offerings. We won't get into it now, but if you read Leviticus 1 through 6, you find five different types of offerings, many of them burnt offerings or sin offerings. Some of them actually thank offerings or praise offerings. We see that the priests were involved in these sacrifices and the blood was transferred into the sanctuary during the daily sacrifices, showing the record of sin. The blood was sprinkled sometimes on the horns of the altar, sometimes on the altar or the side of the altar, depending on the type of sin. The blood was also sprinkled before the veil of the sanctuary. Now, 
there was a yearly time called the Day of Atonement. It was on the 10th day of the seventh month, known in Hebrew as Yom Kippur. That was once a year, the cleansing, the day of cleansing and judgment. The sins from the sanctuary were cleansed, were eradicated, taken out, and transferred symbolically to Satan, or the head of the scapegoat. And they were completely eradicated or removed from the sanctuary. If you look at Leviticus 16, you see that the high priest had a preparation for this Day of Atonement. They were to wash their body with water and put on holy and clean garments. There was even a special censer with this burning coals that came in to bring incense into the most holy place because that cloud needed to cover the mercy seat and the ark of God because the high priest was stepping into that place in the innermost sanctuary and you, you didn't want him to die. There was also preparation for the people. They were to afflict their souls. They were to practice self-denial and fasting. We see this in Leviticus 16, but you also see it in Leviticus 23. I want to read that verse. Leviticus 23, we'll pick it up in verse 27. It's actually partway through the verse. It shall be, talking about the Day of Atonement, a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. You shall do no work on that same day, for it is the Day of Atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. Now, if the people refused to do this preparation, they were going to be cut off. They would no longer be part of God's chosen people. Now, all of this preparation is important because we're going to talk about the Day of Atonement that we live in now and the process of preparation that we're to go through as God's people in these last days. Now, the animals, they had the bull, of course, as a sin offering. Then they had the two goats that were brought forward and lots were cast. One was the Lord's goat, and that was offered as a sin offering for the sins of the people. The other one was the scapegoat or the devil's goat. And we'll see what happens with him in a moment. The blood was sprinkled on and before the mercy seat seven times. The blood was sprinkled on the horns of the golden altar and the brazen altar seven times. It was symbolic, you could say, of cleansing, the complete eradication of sin from that sanctuary. Then the scapegoat, the high priest would confess the sins of all Israel over the scapegoat's head. And he was sent into the wilderness to bear the iniquities of Israel. This represents Satan bearing the ultimate responsibility for the sin problem. So what was the objective of the Day of Atonement in ancient Israel? It was to make atonement for himself, that's the high priest, his household and all the assembly of Israel. Number two, it was to make atonement for the altar, the most holy place and the sanctuary. In other words, it was to remove the sins that had been symbolically transferred to the sanctuary. It was to make a complete and final eradication of sin. And then finally, to transfer the sin where it rightfully belonged, which would be to Satan. So at the end of the day, God had a pure and clean people. God had a pure and clean sanctuary and sin was placed where it rightfully belonged. So when we look at now, starting in 1844, Jesus moving into that high priestly ministry in the most holy place. We look at the cleansing of the sanctuary that's taking place right now. We're going to Hebrews 9. Turn with me to Hebrews 9, and hopefully we'll get in our takeaways here as we look at this cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary, this investigative judgment that's taking place right now, and what needs to happen. God wants, at the end of this, a clean and pure people. He wants a clean and pure sanctuary. And finally, at the very end, sin's going to be placed where it rightfully belongs. Mm -hmm. That's on Satan. Hebrews 9.22. According to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Takeaway number one, Christ's blood brings forgiveness of sins. We know, as Pastor Johnny referenced, in the earthly sanctuary, those were symbols, were they not? The blood of lambs and bulls and goats. That's a symbol of Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Forgiveness does not come through you and I trying harder or gritting our teeth or doing 
doing something legalistic, Jason. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness comes through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Let's keep going. Hebrews 9, 23. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Now, this is very interesting here, this passage. Takeaway number two, only Christ brings ultimate cleansing. Now, what do I mean by that? We're talking here about the second function of Christ's heavenly work. The first function is freedom, Pastor John, from the penalty of sin. That's forgiveness right. of sin. The second function is freedom from the power of sin. That's what's taking place right now. Christ's intercessory work, he wants to eradicate sin mm -hmm. from my life. Mm -hmm. He wants to eradicate sin from your life. We see this ultimate cleansing process begin to take place. We're in Hebrews 9, 24, the next verse. Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself. This is the heavenly sanctuary. Now to appear in the presence of God for us. Takeaway number three, Christ is our high priest in heaven. Right. Even now he is interceding on our behalf. Right. The next verse, Hebrews 9, 25. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. That's a direct reference to the day of atonement. The high priest would go once a year. This is saying Jesus doesn't need to do it every year. What happens? Verse 26. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He appears one time. This is during the pre Advent investigative judgment. This is the time when you and I afflict our souls. This is the time when he wants to purify our hearts and lives. Take away four. Christ purifies us. And during this time, he puts away the sin from our lives. We repent and confess. He forgives and cleanses. We ask for a new heart. He removes the stony heart and gives us a heart of flesh. We ask for the Holy Spirit. His spirit empowers us to follow him. Great Controversy 489. We are now living in the great day of atonement. In the typical service, while the high priest was making atonement for Israel, all were required to afflict their souls by repentance of sin and humiliation before the Lord, lest they be cut off from among the people. In like manner, all who would have their names retained in the book of life would now, in the few remaining days of their probation, afflict their souls before God by sorrow for sin and true repentance. There must be deep, faithful searching of heart. The light, frivolous spirit indulged by so many professed Christians must be put away. There is earnest warfare for all who would subdue those evil tendencies that strive for the mastery. Finally, our last takeaway, we end in Hebrews 9, 28. Christ was offered once to bear the sins for many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin for salvation. Number five, Christ will return for his purified people. In other words, he has already cleansed us completely of sin. And when he comes again, he's there to free us from the presence of sin. Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wow. You know, this is going to be a continued blessing from panelist to panelist. So we want to ask you to continue to stay by. Remember, you can get the notes. They are free and you can sign up to continue to receive them. And you will notice that we don't always get through all the material that we prepared. So you're going to get a lot of good information. We'll be back in just a moment. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three ABN Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back to 3 Avian Sabbath School panel. Great blessings are still in store, and we continue with Brother Jason Bradley. 
Amen. Thank you, Brother Denzi. And uh, Jill, you were preaching a minute ago. I thought we were going to have Amen. to pass around the plate. <laughs> My name is Jason Bradley. I have Tuesday's lesson. It's entitled, The Judgment Has Come. It happened about 16 years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. It was one of the most terrifying days of my life. It was judgment day and the books were opened. I was guilty of breaking the law. And as I stood before the judge with a potential maximum prison sentence of 15 years hanging in the balance, my heart was beating out of my chest. My charges or transgressions were uh, called out and under intense scrutiny by the judge. In court cases like mine, the judge considers criminal history when deciding one's fate. I had my dad by my side and I had my advocate or my defense attorney that was by my side as well. On the left was my accuser known as the prosecutor who represented the state. Um, I accepted a plea deal and took two years of probation instead of going to trial and potentially to prison. Now, in retrospect, I think about the people in the courtroom that had nothing to fear because they were on the right side of the law. What's the purpose of me telling you all this? When it comes to the judgment, we have nothing to fear, no need to be fearful because our God is faithful and has made every provision possible for us to spend eternity with him. We need to ensure that we are on the right side of the law, his law, and at one with him. Now, in our trial, eternity hangs in the balance, but we have an advocate with the Father Amen. whose name is Jesus Christ. The lesson starts by instructing us to compare Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 with Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. What is the similarity between these two passages? Let's look at that. Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand, thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Okay, now let's look at Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. That was such a majestic scene. Uh, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Now, four similarities stand out to me in this. Number one, both passages depict scenes of divine judgment. Mm -hmm. Number two, both passages emphasize God's glory and majesty. Number three, both of them reference an eternal kingdom. And number four, both passages declare God's sovereignty. Mm -hmm. You know, one thing that's for sure is we cannot escape the judgment. Throughout the hands of time, God has had a message of judgment for the world. You know, I think of Noah and the ark, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Jonah and the Ninevites, and the list goes on. But what standard are we being tested by? Great Controversy, page 482. The law of God is the standard by which the characters and the lives of men will be tested in the judgment. Says the wise man, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now I wanna pause right there real quick and just say that the commandments have not been done away with. Mm -hmm. You heard that. For God shall bring every work into judgment. That's Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 13 and 14. The Apostle James admonishes his brethren, so speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. James chapter 2 verse 12. 
let's discuss the books of record before we get too far in our study. The book of life contains the names of all who have ever entered the service of God. And then we have a book of remembrance. Now, that is written before God in which are recorded the good deeds of them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. That's found in Malachi chapter 3, verse 16. Their words of faith, their acts of love are registered in heaven. Nehemiah refers to this when he says, Remember me, O my God, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God. That's in Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 14. In the book of God's remembrance, every deed of righteousness is immortalized. That's beautiful. There, there every temptation resisted, every evil overcome, every word of tender pity expressed is faithfully chronicled. And every act of sacrifice, every suffering and sorrow endured for Christ's sake is recorded. Says the psalmist, thou, shalt, thou tellest my wanderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Psalm chapter 56 verse 8. The investigative judgment takes place prior to the second coming of Christ, as we know. The evidence must be carefully examined before any sentence of judgment is handed out. After all, we serve a just God. Now, just as a forewarning, this is going to be a, a rather lengthy quote, but it's too beautiful to leave out. A great Controversy, page 483, paragraphs 1 and 2. As the books of record are opened in the judgment, the lives of all who have believed on Jesus come in review before God. Beginning with those who first lived upon the earth, our advocate presents the cases of each successive generation and closes with the living. Every name is mentioned, every case closely investigated. Names are accepted, names rejected. When any have sins remaining upon the books of record, unrepented of and unforgiven, their names will be blotted out of the book of life and the record of their good deeds will be erased from the book of God's remembrance. Here's the beautiful part. Mm -hmm. All who have truly repented of sin and by faith claimed the blood of Christ as their atoning sacrifice, have had pardon entered against their names in the books of heaven as they have become partakers of the righteousness of Christ and their characters are found to be in harmony with the law of God. Their sins will be blotted out and they themselves will be accounted worthy of eternal life. The Lord declares by the prophet Isaiah, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 25. Said Jesus, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Whosoever there sh therefore shall confess me before men, him I will confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him I will also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Revelation chapter 3 verse 5 and Matthew chapter 10 verses 32 and 33. You know, there's going to come a time when it's too late to make a decision for Christ. Revelation chapter 22, verses 10 through 12. And he said to me, do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give everyone according to to his work. You know, in the beginning of this lesson, I shared a little bit about my earthly trial and what I went through there. But something I want you to know is that my record has been wiped clean. My record was expunged. Amen. And that's what God wants for each and every one of us. He wants to blot out our transgressions. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's take 
his righteousness, because our righteousness is but filthy rags. Amen. Thank you, Jason. Thank you for being transparent as you were in that application, opening the book of your life to help us see the beauty of Christ. Mine is called the good news of the most holy place. The good news of the most holy place. Let's start by kind of going over some of the scriptures that Jill mentioned. Let's first start about where did the sanctuary come from? Exodus 25, verse 8 and 9, I call the pattern, the pattern. And let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you. That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. And this pattern was in heaven. It was symbolically shown to Moses on how to build it. But what was the purpose of it? Let's go to the purpose of the sanctuary. Psalm, 30, Psalm 77, verse 13. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great as God? Who is so great a God as our God? So the sanctuary, the purpose of it was to intend to show people the way. Remember that phrase, the way. Because later on, I'll repeat this. Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. But this object lesson, all these furnishings were to teach us from the outer court to the inner court, to the holy, to the most holy. All the aspects of it were symbols and signs and purposes to teach us about the ministry of Christ when he was to come. And the Bible says in Hebrews 9, it talks about what this was consi consisted of. Hebrews 9, 1, then indeed even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and an earthly sanctuary. But the earthly wasn't first because it was made from the pattern of the heavenly. Keep this in mind. But how long was it supposed to last? Let's talk about now the duration of the earthly sanctuary. Hebrews 9, verse 9 and 10. It was symbolic for the present time or the time then present in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered. And notice this, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience because he only remembered what he did. It was always in his mind. And verse 10 said, notice what was included. And this is key because many people think that God's law, the Ten Commandments were done away with because they don't understand the sanctuary message. Verse 10 of Hebrews 9, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshy ordinances imposed, and look at the next word, until the time of reformation. It had a duration, a time frame that it was going to last until. Now let's go to Hebrews 10 and verse 1, speaking about the de deficiency. Why did it have just a time frame? Because it was not, it was deficient in some respect. And we'll see why it was deficient. Now, God didn't give Moses a deficient system to follow, but there was something about it that made it deficient. Let's see what the Bible says. Hebrews 10 and verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. So no matter how many lambs and doves and bulls and goats they killed, they were still imperfect because there was a need for something more perfect than just an animal running around, even though they were considered they had to be spotless without blemish. There was still something about them that did not make the, the suppliant, the person bringing the sacrifice perfect. So that's why the Bible says, now, why was this given? What was the purpose of it? Well, Paul, the apostle, told the Galatians, he reminded the Jews in the New Testament who wanted to continue these sacrifices that they did not have to continue. Notice what he said in Galatians 3.19. He asked the Galatians in Galatians 3.19, what purpose then does the law serve? Why did God give it? Because they were hooked to that. They missed Jesus, but they were continually hooked to the ceremonial system. He makes it very clear. What purpose then does the law serve? And notice what he responded by saying, it was added because of transgression till the seed should come. Notice the duration is once again listed. It will only last till the seed come, capital seed. It was only there till Christ would come. And notice why, to whom the promise was made and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Well, who was this mediator? Notice the word there is small. The word mediator is small. It's not a large M, meaning Christ the mediator. There was somebody that was communicating this to the children of Israel. Now let's go to 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 3 and find out who this is. 
and keep the charge of the law of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments and his testimonies as it is written in the law of Moses, mm. that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. Mm -hmm. Moses was that earthly mediator. Moses was given this. He wrote it down in a book. The Ten Commandments were written on two tablets of stone. In Deuteronomy 5 and verse 22, speaking about the Ten Commandments, the Bible says, and when he finished the writing, he added nothing more. Some translation says no more. Mm -hmm. Ten Commandments, not 600 plus laws, which were a part of the ceremonial system mm -hmm. that we're going to be for that we're referring to right now as we relate to the heavenly sanctuary. So Moses was that earthly mediator. He spoke to the children of Israel. He told them, this is what God wants you to do. But they got hooked on the symbols and they missed the Christ. Well, how strong was it? Hebrews 9 verse 22. Let's look at the strength of the law. The Bible says, and according to the law, almost all things were purged with blood and without shedding of blood, there is no remission. Why? The wages of sin is death. The blood that the animals were shedding, as Jill pointed out, being sprinkled in various parts of the sanctuary, those were symbolic of the blood that Jesus would shed. That's why when we look at the weakness of it, the inefficacy of it, the duration of it, the weakness of even the person that mediated it, it says these things did not have enough strength and they were just for a certain period of time. That's why people, that's why Paul spoke to those in Colossae, these words in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14 to 16. He says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements, whose handwriting? Moses' handwriting that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he, Christ, has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them. How? On the cross, triumphing over them in it. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or a regard to a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. People see that word Sabbaths and say, well, there it is. The Ten Commandments are done away with. No, you go to Leviticus chapter 23, you'll see all the ceremonial Sabbaths that are listed there. The eighth day Sabbath, the first day Sabbath, the seven month Sabbath, the seventh week Sabbath, the day of atonement, the Feast of Tabernacles, the wave sheaf offering, the, all these different Sabbaths, not the weekly Sabbath at the end of creation week. So don't get them mixed up because one was a part of a law that had no strength based on the inefficacy of the blood of the lambs, but it doesn't stop there. Look how ineffective it was. Hebrews 10 verse four, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. That's why the Lord said he got rid of it by nailing it to the cross. But what was it replaced with? Let's get excited now. Hebrews 9 verse 11 to 15. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come. Notice in Colossians, it says these things were not good. But when Jesus shed his blood, he was of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. And notice going right back to Colossians, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more, speaking about the good news of the sanctuary, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And verse 15, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Now get this. This is powerful. I want you to not miss this. All those sacrifices, all those lambs, all that shed blood, all those earthly priests, it meant absolutely nothing. It would be like a big eraser wiping all that out if Jesus did not die. Mm. None of those things could have made us eternal. None of those things could have taken away our sins. That's why it said by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant. So therefore Christ and Hebrews four, verse 14, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest which cannot sympathize 
with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Therefore, here's the promise, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's the good news in the sanctuary. Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Lomaking. Now, as I'm listening to each one of you, I get the distinct feeling that the sanctuary is full of good news. That's right. And it's not hidden off in some corner somewhere. It is like central to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And my name is Daniel Perrin, and I have Thursday's lesson that we're studying Jesus, our advocate in the sanctuary, sorry, in the judgment. Does that sound like good news as well? Mm -hmm. I want to share with you something that maybe you have not thought of before. If you're reading through the book, The Great Controversy, and you want to learn about the sanctuary, there are three chapters you're going to go to. Uh, chapter, th chapter 23 is called, What is the Sanctuary? There are 38 Bible references in that chapter. Chapter 24, in the Holy of Holies, there are 27 Bible references in that chapter. Chapter uh, 28, facing life's record, there are 49 Bible references in that chapter. Those three chapters combined, combined there are 114 Bible references. And this is just a short Bible study through the sanctuary, through the heavenly sanctuary. So if you go to those three chapters, which are covered in this lesson, you're going to get a broad picture that introduces to you this great topic. Now, Jesus said to his disciples, and he says, says to us, follow me. How far? How far are we supposed to follow him? Some of his footsteps or all of his footsteps? We follow him through his baptism, reliance upon his father's power, implicit trust in the Holy Spirit through his preaching and his healing, then through Gethsemane, then his trial, then to Calvary, then to the resurrection and his ascension and his enthronement there in heaven. But that is not where Jesus' footsteps end. He says, follow me all the way. And so this is what we've been looking at so far this week. Jesus goes into the heavenly sanctuary. And we can picture that through the symbols of the sanctuary of the blood, as Jill described, going step by step from the altar into the holy place yeah. to the altar of incense sprinkled before the veil and ultimately into the most holy place, God's very presence. And we are invited to follow Jesus who goes before us into God's very presence. I can't do that on my own. I am sinful. I need help. Great Controversy, page 489, a different quote on the same page from Jill's. The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. Wow. By his death, he began that work, which after his resurrection, he ascended to complete in heaven. So let's be clear about this. Jesus' death on the cross was completely 100% effective for, for purchasing us uh, from sin. But in heaven, Jesus ministers to us that full power of the cross. That's right. So what is he doing in the heavenly sanctuary? Uh, 1 John 2 verse 1 gives us a, a picture into what's happening in the sanctuary. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin, but if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Right. Well, what's an advocate? You hear about maybe a patient advocate, an advocate for your rights. Uh, as a teacher, you could have a, a faculty advocate if you had to go before uh, the administrative council for some disciplinary issue. Have a faculty member just kind of on your side. Uh, an advocate pleads the cause on behalf of another person. I need an advocate. I, I need an advocate. I've wandered from Jesus. Like Peter, I've, I've denied it, Jesus. I have, I've been like Judas. I've, I have cherished sins. I need an advocate. I feel like David was, he stood before the prophet Gad there in 2 Samuel 24, where he says, please let me fall into the hands of the Lord and not into the hands of man. Amen. Well, there's good news in Hebrews 9, 24. Listen to this. When Jesus enters the most holy place in heaven, heavenly sanctuary, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God. Two words here, for us. Amen. But how is Jesus advocating? 
Is he arguing with the father up there? I, I want to take them out. They have defied my law. No, please don't, don't do that. No, that's not the way it goes. John 16, 26 and 27, Jesus says, in that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say that I shall pray for you, the father for you, for the father himself loves you. Jesus, the son and the father united in purpose, completely, completely united. So who's on our side? Who's our advocate? Jesus is, and united with the Father, both on our side. That's you right. don't have a single adversary in heaven. Amen. The adversary was thrown out. He's gone from heaven. Everyone in heaven is on your side, and they have poured out every expense of heaven, emptied, emptied the checking account, emptied every account to pay for you on your behalf. And it's not just that Jesus takes our side like a, a defense attorney, a criminal defense attorney who's assigned to find some loophole if they possibly can, whether you're guilty or not. No, Jesus is on our side. Listen to this judgment scene that Jason pointed out in Daniel chapter 7. Right. Uh, we're at a judgment scene, verse 13. It says, behold, one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the ancient of days like the son of man. He's like us, but he's infinitely better. That's but right. I've got someone on my side who knows my weaknesses, who's been through what I've been through. He's not somebody who can't sympathize. Hebrews 4, 15 says that. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. No, he was in all points tempted as we are, yet he was not, was without sin. No one can say, you don't know what it's like. You don't know what I've been through. I, as a husband, while my wife giving birth to our children, I could say, honey, I know how you're feeling. I don't. <laughs> Another mother could, could possibly say that. I lack the experience, but Jesus has gone through what we've gone through. Let me give you another picture of Jesus as our advocate. Galatians 1 verses 3 and 4 talks about Jesus who gave himself for our sins. He has paid such a high price for you. Why would he give up on you now? I've paid everything for them. I'm not going to quit. I love this statement in Our Father Cares, page 35. Having engaged in the work, the amazing work of redemption, Christ determined in, the count, in counsel with his Father to spare nothing, however costly, to withhold nothing, however highly it might be esteem, est, estimated, that would rescue the poor sinner. He would give all heaven to this work, work of salvation, of restoring the moral image of God in man. Therefore, we understand what it means in Heb Hebrews 7, 25 and 26, that he always lives to make yeah. intercession for them. Yeah. He's on your side. He doesn't quit. It's not over yet. There's more good news. Our advocate is also our judge. Yeah. John 5, 22, for the father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the son. And there's even more. The plan of salvation is not a partial plan. It is a complete plan. God didn't bring the people out of Egypt in order to let them uh, die there at the Red Sea. He supported them through the Red Sea and he eliminated the pursuer. Amen. That is the advocate who is on their side. I don't not just need to be forgiven of sins past. I need to be given the power to be an overcomer over sin now. Right. And so this is why Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, Amen. for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Why is it sufficient? Because he has poured out all the power of heaven. That's the grace. Grace yes. is not just forgiveness for things past. It is the power in the present yes. over sin. John 15 verse 5, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. That's the grace. That's the victory right then. A fruitful Christian is not losing battles. They are victorious. Yes. Right. For without me, you can do nothing. So Jesus is not just our advocate to shield us from a legal mess we've gotten into. He is an advocate against the power of sin in my life. Being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. Okay. I want to end here with the, the great controversy again, page 430, paragraph 2. It is those who by faith follow Jesus in the great work of the atonement who receive the benefits 
That's plural there. All the work of the advocate. We, we got to go with Jesus into the, the process of everything that he's done and say, give me every benefit, the benefits of his mediation in their behalf. While those who reject the light which brings to view this work of ministration are not benefited thereby. That's a deep, that's a thoughtful thing to ponder. Now, I, I raced really quick because I wanted to read as much of this as I could. I'm only gonna get about 20 seconds worth, but this is one of my favorite advocate texts in the Bible. It's in Romans 8, 31 to 39. Wherever I stop, you just oh, pick yes. up your Bible and you read on. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That's right. Amen, amen. Wow. amen. Thank you so much. What a blessing it has been to listen to each and every one of you. And it's just full of wonderful things. We want to give each one of you a moment to say some final words. My heart is full. I think this is one of my favorite oh. lessons. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm thinking of John chapter 15. You did not choose me, but I chose you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. God has chosen us to righteousness in him. Amen. Right. You know, the question that comes to mind is what more do we want? Jesus was our death row volunteer. He was our, he's our advocate. He's, he's everything and he loves us and desires to spend eternity with us. What more do we want? That's right. And Peter, the apostle makes it so clear about this wonderful picture. I was about to stand up and shout during this. This is the most powerful lesson. I, I mean, when you think about the goodness of the sanctuary, I'll just take a second here. What better news can you get? It's not about just praise music. It's about praising the Lord for what he's doing for us right now. Mm -hmm. 1 Peter 1 verse 18 says, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. That's good news in the sanctuary. Amen. So when the enemy comes to you and says, you're not worthy, look what you've done. I am not worthy. I have done that, but I have an advocate. I have a savior and he gives me the righteousness of Christ. Tell him that. Amen. Thank you so much. It has been such a blessing and I hope you have been blessed. Remember, you can get the notes free by writing to ssp at 3abn.org. And I want to leave you also with Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Therefore, he, that is Jesus, is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Join us next week, lesson number nine, the foundation of God's government.